So certain variables can affect how fast an enzyme catalyzes a reaction. The four variables we're looking at here are enzyme concentration, substrate concentration, temperature, and pH. So basically, for an enzyme substrate complex to form and for a reaction take, to take place, they've got to collide. An enzyme and a substrate have got to bump into each other. Essentially, these molecules are just moving around with a given amount of kinetic energy in straight lines. And if they bump into each other and they collide with enough energy, then that is going to have that a reaction will take place. So affecting the concentrations of enzymes and substrates is going to have an effect on the rate of reaction because there's more chance or less chance of them colliding. But also changing the kinetic energy of these molecules is going to mean there's going to be more or less chance of them colliding as well. So let's start with enzyme concentration. Now enzymes are actually really, really efficient. You only need a very small amount of them for a reaction to work. However, if you do add more, then the rate of reaction will increase. Uh, as shown by this uh, straight line graph here. However, this isn't typical of a reaction because normally what you have is that the substrate will start to run out and become a limiting factor and the graph will start to tail off. So if you look at this graph as a comparison here, we've got four different enzyme concentrations shown by the different colors of lines and the volume of gas collected uh, in this reaction, which is a sign of essentially the rate of reaction, how much product we're getting produced. And you can see that they've all started to tail off because at various points the substrate has become a limiting factor here. So really, if we wanted to compare the effect of enzyme concentration, we should look just at the initial rate of reaction, just what happens right at the beginning of the graph. So what you want to do there is to take a tangent at the very beginning of the graph and work out the gradient of that tangent in order to compare the effect of enzyme concentration. If you took those tangent readings and plotted them on a graph, then you would end up looking back at that straight line graph we just saw on the previous slide. Now, the second variable to investigate is substrate concentration. Now, essentially, if you increase the substrate concentration, then there's going to be more chance of an enzyme colliding with a substrate molecule. There are more substrate molecules uh, moving around, more chance an enzyme is going to come across one and bump into it, and a collision is going to happen. However, there becomes a certain point where the rate stops increasing because it doesn't matter how many more substrate molecules you add, the enzymes are all busy. They're saturated, They're, all their active sites are full. They can't uh, combine with any more substrates any quicker. And so that graph is gonna level off and plateau out. We say at this point that Vmax has been achieved and this is the maximum rate of reaction. At that point, if you add some more enzymes, then the reaction can start increasing again. But any more substrate is going to have no greater effect on the rate of the reaction. Now, temperature is a little bit different because temperature is all about kinetic energy. If you heat up a molecule, it will move around more and more and more. It has more kinetic energy, it will move quicker. So if we heat enzymes up, they will start to move around faster and they're more likely to, to have a successful collision with a substrate molecule. So as you can see from the graph, an increase in temperature means an increase in the rate of reaction. However, at a certain point, the amount of kinetic energy starts to interfere with the bonds in the, in the molecule and the enzymes bonds, the tertiary and quaternary structure, it starts to break down. Now, that is obviously so, so important to the function of this molecule. It has this really specific shape. And so if it starts to lose that shape because the bonding starts to break, it's usually the weaker bonds, such as hydrogen and ionic bonds that break first then the uh, active site will no longer fit in this, um, fit the substrate and uh, it will stop being able to catalyze reactions. And very quickly, as you can see by the graph, uh, the rate of reaction decreases back uh, all the way down to zero as denaturation occurs. Now this is a permanent change to the enzyme. It's not reversible. You cannot go back once the enzymes have become denatured. Now you can show the effect of temperature on a reaction mathematically by looking at something called the temperature coefficient or Q10. And this basically is showing how much the rate increases as you go up by 10 degrees. 
So every 10 degrees, how much quicker has the rate got? Now, most reactions, Q10 equals two. Every time you, add, you go up by 10 degrees C, the rate of reaction doubles. However, once you get to that optimum temperature, uh, it, it, this is no longer the case. In most enzymes, um, in humans, the optimum temperature is about 40 degrees C. There are some organisms that enzymes can work in really extreme uh, temperature. Uh, things like the snow flea, which can work at about minus 10 degrees C, or thermophilic bacteria, which work at about 90 degrees C. So lastly, pH. What about pH? Well, it's not too dissimilar from uh, temperature in terms of the fact that there is an optimum uh, level at which the molecule will behave and work at its best. Most enzymes work at pH 7, although some can work at extremes of pH, such as pepsin in your stomach, which works best at about pH 2. Now, if you go outside of that optimum, either more acidic or, or more alkali, then again, the bonding starts to be affecting, affected by those hydrogen ions. Uh, and the hydrogen bonds um, and disulfide bonds start to change or break um, and the 3D shape starts to be lost. And again, that active site and that uh, substrate no longer fit and the enzyme becomes denatured. Now, some substances actually stop enzymes from working altogether. These are called enzyme inhibitors. They can be reversible or they can be irreversible. Now, the two we're gonna look at are types of reversible inhibition. These ones you can reverse, and you can either have competitive reversible inhibition or non-competitive reversible inhibition. They are really useful in uh, metabolic reactions because it means you can control the reaction. But when you remove them, uh, the reaction will start up again. So this is a, a way that reactions can be limited and controlled in the body, which is a really important thing to be able to do. Now in competitive inhibition, what happens is that there is a molecule that can block the active site. So therefore it's in direct competition with a substrate because they can both get into the active site. In non-competitive inhibition, we're looking at a molecule that binds to a different location on the enzyme and it changes the shape of the active site so that the substrate no longer binds anymore. But it's non-competitive because it's not competing for the same binding site. Now you should be familiar with this graph and um, these different uh, lines showing the different types of inhibition. Competitive inhibition, you can see there, it doesn't have um, that much of, it has a, an effect obviously, it slows down the rate of reaction, but it's not as drastic as non-competitive. That's because substrates can still bind, um, they're just not as gonna happen as regularly because they're in competition with the inhibitor. However, Non-competitive, you can see, is a bit more extreme because once that inhibitor is added, the substrates uh, can no longer bind at all if the active site changes shape. Now, non-competitive inhibition, this one where it binds to another location on the enzyme, is an example of allosteric regulation. This means that it's binding to a separate site. It's not binding to the active site and therefore it's allosteric. Now, most of the time this inhibits uh, the enzyme, but actually you do get examples where you get a molecule that actually activates the enzyme instead as an opposite effect. So it can be used as an inhibitor at this allosteric regulation, or it can be used as an activator as well. Now, something really interesting is the idea of end product inhibition. This is sometimes when you want to regulate a reaction that's happening um, based on how much product you've got at the end. So if you've got a reaction that's working really well and you've got loads of product being formed, then you might want that reaction to slow down or stop. So that product that you've made, once it's in a high enough concentration, can actually go back and it actually inhibits the enzyme at the beginning of the reaction. So it slows the reaction down and you make less of the product. If the product starts to then run out, then because the concentration falls, it no longer inhibits the early enzyme and the reaction starts up again. So it's like a self-regulating mechanism. The end product is usually a non-competitive inhibitor binding reversibly to the aliste an allosteric site of the enzyme. Now the example you'll come across in the course on this is something called PFK. Okay, now this is found in respiration. In respiration you want to make ATP molecules and there is an enzyme involved called phosphofructokinase or PFK. 
And what happens is that when you make ATP, uh, you need um, phosphofructokinase. But once you've got lots of ATP made, it actually reversibly non-competitively inhibits this phosphofructokinase. So when ATP is low, phosphofructokinase works really fast and makes lots of ATP. But when ATP is high, it goes back and it starts to inhibit phosphofructokinase. So the reaction slows down. Now, pharmaceutical manufacturers have actually taken advantage of this um, idea of inhibition and created drugs that can, um, that can work as inhibitors of enzymes and therefore block reactions from happening. Now, as enzymes are proteins, as you know, then they must be coded for by genes. Genes code for proteins. So you can have genetic mutations that can affect how well enzymes work. And there is a particular one you should know about, which is to do with a gene called the PAH gene on chromosome number 12. Now, this is uh, if you had a mutation in the PAH gene, you end up with a condition called phenylketonuria. It's a really rare genetic condition that you get from birth. And basically, it causes the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase not to be produced properly. And the, it's, it, the mutation means that the, the amino acid aren't um, selected properly and the protein doesn't form properly, doesn't have the right shape, it doesn't work anymore. Now, if you don't have this enzyme, then you can't convert phenylalanine, which is an amino acid, into something called tyrosine. And phenylalanine builds up in your system. It actually becomes deaminated to phenylpyruvate, and that can cause really serious and irreversible brain damage. But um, because we've now discovered this, there is actually a test, a simple test that can be done. It's done on all babies in the UK since about the 1960s um, by taking a small blood sample from the, the heel. It's called a heel prick test once the baby is born. And that is sent off, the blood is sent off, and it's tested for PKU. If you've got it as a baby, then you just mean uh, that you need to have a specific diet that is low in protein, and especially aspartame, which is a sweetener, which has lots of phenylalanine in it. So you ought to avoid that and, and keep it low, and you can live a very healthy life.